So welcome everybody to our, uh, our training session for the 2021 field season. And we're gonna get started with a kind of similar presentation to, to what we had last year with a couple of updates. And then as Tamara mentioned, uh, we do have a new program to tell you about. So first off, I'd like to say a big thank you um, to all of our volunteers who have signed up. We've got 28 volunteers uh, this year signed up with us uh, monitoring 33 different sites. And so we really appreciate that. And uh, just to let you know some of the things that your observations um, can sort of help us with, things like tracking the relationship between algae growth and other conditions, uh, such as the temperature and conductivity of the water and weather factors as well. Collecting invasive species settings and species at risk. And so this really helps with proactive management and protection of, uh, of sensitive habitats. Identifying areas that are in need of, uh, of cleanups or of uh, habitat restoration. And then tracking indicators of climate change. So the water temperature readings that you collect uh, and also wind conditions are really useful in that regard. Uh, and then determining uh, if you're a stream, stream watch volunteer, uh, sort of looking at how thermally stable uh, your tributary is. And that sort of helps us uh, provide some rationale for protection of those cool and cold water habitats. So to just touch on, uh, on some things to keep in mind uh, when you're doing your monitoring. Uh, so safety is uh, of primary importance to us, uh, your safety. So you wanna make sure that you're planning your outing and sort of keeping an eye on the weather. Obviously it's not a good idea to go out there in a thunderstorm. And so definitely wanna postpone that sampling if necessary. Um, make sure you're communicating with someone, uh, especially you know, if you're kind of going off your primary residence property to, uh, to go and do monitoring. Make sure someone knows where, where you are and when you expect to be back. Or better yet, if you can uh, drag a family member out there with you, then that's great. Um, bringing a cell phone is also useful in case anything happens, uh, but we are aware that, uh, that there's some areas that don't have the greatest service. Uh, make sure you have the appropriate uh, clothing, footwear. So for stream folks, that might mean wearing rubber boots or waders if you have them. Uh, sunscreen and that sort of thing, a, a good hat. Uh, for those of you who are sampling from a boat, uh, you might want to make sure that you have all the required safety equipment and have your life jacket. Um, and we also provide a whistle with your training kits as well. So just encouraging you to, to take that out with you uh, in case anything should happen. Uh, you want to be very mindful of any surrounding hazards that you may encounter at your monitoring site. So particularly in the case of the stream sites where the banks might be uh, steep or kind of slippery and unstable. Uh, rivers might be flowing quickly and, and could pose a hazard in that sense. Uh, and then on the, the lake sites, um, especially right on Georgian Bay, can run into some large wave conditions that could be hazardous. And then finally, just knowing about any poisonous plants or animals that are in your area. So in particular, poison ivy, um, giant hogweed, and wild parsnip. And so just to show some images of those, uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with poison ivy. And uh, many of you have probably seen wild parsnip as well. It's, it's quite common in, uh, in weedy areas and giant hogweed in particular um, around stream sites, something to be aware of. So of course, we also have to mention the pandemic. I was really hoping for this year, we wouldn't have to have this slide in here, but uh, unfortunately that's, that's just where we are. And so uh, similar to last year, we're gonna give out the kits uh, sort of through a contactless drop-off uh, process. And again, if you're monitoring with anyone outside your kind of your household, um, we would recommend uh, definitely keeping that two meter distance uh, and also wearing a mask if you're, if you're doing that, but preferably um, just sort of sticking with folks from your own household. Uh, limiting any other exposure to others just by volunteering um, on your own private property whenever that's possible. And I think this will apply to anyone here. Um, but just sort of um, being mindful of sharing equipment between volunteers if you are in a group of, of a couple of people. Um, so for example, if, uh, if one person's doing the secchi disc and the other person does the hand meter and you sort of like stick to those two different roles. Um, you can also, if you are sharing equipment um, between volunteers, uh, sanitizing the equipment between sessions. And so this particularly uh, for things like the, the pool thermometer and secchi disc, that's, that's easy enough to do. For the hand meters, um, definitely would want to keep the cap on if, if you're cleaning the outside of the unit. Um, and ideal to not share the monoculars at all because uh, we really can't clean those without damaging them. 
uh, important to wash and sanitize, as you've heard many, many times, uh, and adhere to any um, any rules and regulations um, through your municipality and also the, the local health unit if you're on public property as well. All right, so. As far as uh, logistics for field monitoring, um, when we're sampling, so it's sort of uh, as long as your water body is free of ice. So the, the sampling season uh, can start as early as, uh, as late April, early May, and go right into October or even November if your site conditions allow. And so the frequency is really kind of up to you and sort of depending if you're at that location, uh, if you're to so your primary residence and you want to do daily measurements, weekly or we would say bi-weekly at a minimum every other week, uh, just to give us kind of enough data to, to look at some seasonal patterns, if that's possible. But we understand, you know, things come up um, and it's not always possible to, to maintain that kind of schedule, but do the best that you can. Um, and try to be consistent as far as when you're sampling as well. So it's easy to not want to go out when the weather's not the greatest, uh, but that does sort of introduce some bias into the measurements. So the easiest thing to do is sort of pick the same time of day. So if you're gonna do mornings or evenings uh, and the same day of the week, if you can. So that means that, you know, if the weather happens to be not the greatest that day, you're still picking up those, uh, those varying conditions. And for those who do have a rain gauge uh, and are gonna be measuring that this summer, um, that's something that will be recorded after each rain event. So just making sure we capture, uh, capture those conditions. As far as where you're gonna monitor, um, so for a lot of you, your site uh, is gonna be the same as what you did last year. Um, and for those who might be new to the program, basically looking to choose a site that is convenient to, to monitor um, and that you have permission to access. So it's either on public property or on your own property, uh, or maybe you have permission from, from a friend or a neighbor. And also that's safe to access. So I mentioned, you know, stream banks that could be, uh, could be a little dicey to access. Um, or a, a lake site that maybe the, the shoreline is not, not super stable. You want to sample at the same location each time. So it's helpful to sort of um, pick some markers along, along a stream section or a lake, um, you know, your shoreline to make sure you're kind of referencing that same spot each time. Uh, as far as the lake sites, uh, you can monitor from the shoreline, uh, from your, the end of your dock if you have one, or from out on a boat. And so there was a little bit of confusion about this uh, last year as far as folks that were measuring uh, Secchi Disc, uh, the Secchi Disc depth. Uh, so hopefully this, this clears things up a little bit. Uh, basically, so if you're, if you're not doing the Secchi depth uh, measurements, um, mm -hmm. then you can monitor basically um, between half meter to a meter depth or at the end of the dock. So depending on what your shoreline setup is like. If you are gonna be measuring Secchi depth, uh, your site should be deep enough so that you can't see that, that disc on the lake bed. So if you're at the end of a dock and you lower this disc down and you can see it uh, down there, then it's preferable that you go offshore um, on a boat. So you want to make sure that that, that site is, is going to be um, sort of useful for, for that measurement. Um, so if you're going to go out on a boat, uh, just sort of going offshore enough that you can't see the lake bed anymore. For folks that are doing the stream watch program, uh, you can do it from either the stream bank, if that's easily accessible, uh, or even off a bridge, um, you know, sort of a, a roadside, roadside crossing, that type of thing. So you're looking for flowing sections that uh, don't have any stagnant areas to them and finding sort of as straight a section as you can uh, that doesn't have too many log jams and that sort of thing. And you'll, you'll see why um, once we get into some of the flow videos in a moment. Uh, and again, just sort of choosing landmarks to, to help you find the same spot each time. So some helpful items to bring uh, sort of in addition to the stuff that you're going to get in your kits. Uh, so clipboard, pencil, that sort of thing. If you're, uh, if you're going to write down your um, recordings on a printed data sheet, uh, get in touch with us and we can provide some of those. Um, or uh, preferably, we'd, uh, we're going to send folks uh, Google Sheets and I'll, I'll get into, uh, into the data recording in a minute. Um, life jackets, if that's applicable for your site and any other safety gear you might need for, uh, for boating. Uh, if you're going to a stream sampling site uh, that, that might be a bit faster moving, you can bring a, a safety throw rope for, um, and you would want to have a partner out there with you as well. Um, helpful to bring a garbage bag or gloves uh, if it's a, a public area as well. Um, if you want to do any shoreline cleanups, that would, that would be great. 
um, disposable gloves if, uh, if you're sampling for suspected blue-green algae. Uh, and then a clean container, so something like a yogurt tub um, that you can rinse out really well and do your water measurements uh, if the conditions are really wavy, and, and we'll get into some of those details. Uh, rubber boots or hip waders, as I mentioned, particularly for the, the stream sites, um, or if you're wading into a, a lakeshore site. Uh, for those who are doing stream temperature um, loggers, uh, you want to bring out uh, a hammer and mallet uh, and uh, some other tools for, uh, for doing that installation. Hammer or a smartphone um, will help you uh, take pictures and, and do your data recording. And then for those who do get the handometer, um, it's ideal to bring uh, distilled water, a bit of distilled water with you uh, just to rinse, rinse your meter and also the, the container if you're using that before and after. So in terms of the data sheets, uh, we're sort of trying to move towards uh, streamlining the data entry process, but it's uh, getting an app going is, is a little more, more challenging than what we anticipated. So unfortunately we won't have an app for this year, um, but so we're still gonna continue on using Google Sheets. So this time around, um, everyone's gonna have their site ID that, that you can enter into the sheet and each participant is going to get a unique spreadsheet that will be housed on Google Drive. So we'll be able to see the results sort of as you enter them in, but you'll have your own unique spreadsheet. So hopefully uh, that goes a bit more seamlessly this time around. And as I mentioned, if you would prefer to record it on paper, um, you can let us know and we'll send you um, the paper data sheets as well. Um, so into Google Sheets, uh, if you don't already have that Google Sheets app, um, you can install that onto your, your smart, smart smartphone or tablet. Uh, and then you're basically just going to open um, the spreadsheet uh, that you'll see the link in an email and save it to your device or to that Google Drive folder. And then it should be easy enough to sort of navigate uh, to that file. So just some things to, to keep in mind as you're filling out your data. Um, Want to make sure that each column is filled out and you don't leave any blanks. So a blank really to us, we don't know if, if um, that means zero or nothing to report or um, that the observation just wasn't made at all. So if, it's, if that column is not applicable to your site, you can just enter NA. Or if you have, you're observing, um, say it's like wildlife and you don't see anything, then just enter zero. And that indicates to us that, uh, that you didn't notice anything there. Um, if there hasn't been any change in quite a number of those observations since your last date, you can also just enter no change and that will, uh, that will suffice as well. And then make sure that you're entering date and time sort of in the format uh, that's given in the data sheet. So just a little bit, a uh, little bit of a walkthrough as far as how to access that, uh, that spreadsheet. Um, so you're going to get a link in your email, you can just click on that, um, and that will take you into the Google Sheet. And then the next time you want to access it, if you go to your Google Drive uh, on your smartphone, and then you should see a little tab where it says shared files, and that's where you'll find um, listing of, of the, uh, the data sheets that we've shared with you. So you might have a couple of them. Some folks are going to be doing stream site, lake site, and possibly rain gauge. So then you could have up to three different uh, sheets that, uh, that we'll send it to you. Okay, moving right along. So uh, just some pointers here. I wanted to talk a little bit about taking field photos. So photos are some of the most important information that we can get from our participants. Uh, so it really helps us uh, sort of get a context for the site and you know take a good look at conditions. And then if we're trying to identify anything that you've observed, it helps to have really good, uh, good quality photos. So what we recommend uh, to start out, so you know, kind of for your first field visit, you can do this uh, at either a stream or a lake site, just sort of documenting um, what the site looks like from all directions. So looking both um, sort of upstream, downstream, looking down at the, uh, the stream bed and sort of the banks and, and what that all looks like. Uh, and then similarly for, for the lake site, uh, looking in all, all directions and just sort of documenting that. Um, it is generally preferred to take landscape orientation photos. You just sort of capture um, a wider view of uh, especially those, those landscape pictures. Obviously making sure that, uh, that things are in focus is helpful, um, particularly with uh, plants and animals, getting photos of those. It's helpful, uh, particularly with plants, to sort of get a wider shot. So we get, and you can see the example of uh, glossy buckthorn 
shrub there. Uh, so we have sort of a, a wider angle of what the, the plant looks like and then sort of closer shots um, that will help us see some of the identifying features. Um, important if you're photographing uh, things like frogs, snakes, turtles, all those kind of lovely critters that, that we see out there, um, that you make sure you don't handle those, uh, those wildlife. Um, so in a lot of cases, they may be a species at risk um, that are quite sensitive and best to just sort of uh, leave them be. Uh, when you are taking photos, if you notice that there's other people in the background, uh, just sort of being mindful of any privacy, con privacy concerns, um, you know, maybe just taking pictures with their back turned, that sort of thing. Um, and really what we're wanting to see is, is documentation of things like, so if you're noticing that the water has a, a really strong coloration to it, um, you know, greenish or brownish colors, you can take a picture of the water and, and that sort of helps us. Uh, if you see any algae growing along the, the sides or in the water, um, taking pictures of that. And then things like um, erosion, you know, uh, wind damage, flooding damage, that sort of thing, um, invasive species uh, that you're noticing and, uh, and species at risk if you're lucky enough to see anything. Um, so in terms of your location, uh, so a lot of you will, will have sent in sort of your, your address, um, and your intended monitoring site. And for those who have not done so yet, um, you can use some of these different tools uh, to get your, um, your latitude and longitude. And so going to something like Google Maps on your phone, um, either on a smartphone or a on a computer. And there's a couple other links that I put up here uh, that will take you to some more detailed online mapping, which you might just be interested in kind of for your own, um, your own knowledge. And so you can really zoom in and, and see some uh, some high resolution um, satellite aerial photography. And just a quick note as well, um, I know there's a couple of folks who might be moving in between water bodies doing multiple sites. And so one thing we just wanted to point out, uh, and this also applies to, to anyone really who's, who's maybe boating in, in different water bodies, the, uh, the importance of cleaning equipment before you move stuff around. So really we're trying to prevent uh, the movement of invasive species. So things like zebra mussels, um, aquatic plants that might hitch a ride onto your gear. Um, so the, um, the protocol here is called clean, drain, dry, and really just uh, trying to get all those components that might be trying to hitch a ride, um, washing stuff like your trailer, um, boat, and any other equipment, or allowing things to really um, dry out. So, you know, kind of five days is what they say. Um, which might be not entirely doable. So uh, definitely just making sure that, that you wash things down really well. And in terms of our monitoring equipment, um, so being pretty delicate with things like the Hanameter, uh, but most of the other items, you can give them a pretty good scrub down if you are moving between sites. Okay, so we're gonna get into some of the how-to videos. So this little device that comes in your kit uh, is called a HANA meter. Um, it's basically just a little water tester that we'll use to measure uh, the air temperature, water temperature, uh, conductivity, and pH. So uh, when you first take the, the tester out, make sure it's been in the shade because we're going to measure air temperature first. So you're going to turn it on uh, with the little on button. It says on slash mode. So hold that down, you have to press it pretty hard. Uh, take the little cap off the bottom, so it just pulls right off. And you'll see air temperature uh, down at the bottom of the screen down here in degrees Celsius. And so it's quite hot out today, it's measuring 32 uh, degrees. So you'll mark that down onto your data sheet. And then to measure the water temperature, um, if it's a nice calm day, you can just stick the meter right in. If it is a bit windy or if you're doing this from shore, you can actually take a bucket and just get a, a sample of water and uh, stick your tester in that way. So whatever is uh, easiest and uh, best for conditions. So we're gonna go right into the water down here. So right now I've got it on conductivity mode and up here there's a little symbol, it looks like a little U and a capital S. So that's micro Siemens and that's the measure of conductivity. So we'll keep it on that and the temperature is down at the bottom. That always stays there. So uh, put it down into the water, uh, basically where it has the little water droplet. So it's covering all the sensors and you have to keep it in the water to do the measurement. 
So we've got 390 as our conductivity and 27.2 as our water temperature. If you notice that the numbers are fluctuating, just leave it in the water until they stabilize and then you can take your reading. Okay, so once we've got that, now we're gonna do pH. So you'll press this set and hold button um, twice. Let's see, press it again. So the, when you press it the first time, it'll switch to PPM units at the top, and that's total dissolved solids, which we don't actually need uh, for this reading. So if I hit it again, then you'll see over on the side it says pH. So again, we'll dip it down. And we've got 7.65 pH units. And then just turn the unit off, put the cap back on, make sure it's going on the right way uh, with the HANA logo at the front. And that's how we do our air temperature and uh, water testing readings. All right, so I'm just going to demonstrate uh, how to take a air and water temperature reading with the pool thermometer. So some of you in your kit are going to have a thermometer like this. Uh, it's marked in uh, degrees Celsius and Fahrenheit, but we want Celsius. Uh, it's marked in two degree increments, so just keep uh, be aware of that when you're making a reading. So if it's a little bit choppy like this, sometimes it's easier to fill a small bucket, yogurt container, whatever, with your water sample uh, and then take your temperature reading. So first we're actually going to do air temperature. So while the thermometer has been in the shade, uh, we can read here, it says 26 degrees. So now, I'm going to take that water sample and just let it uh, equilibrate there for a few minutes. So it'll take a little bit of time for uh, if there's a big difference between air temperature and water temperature for those to, uh, to adjust. And you can just take a look, see if it's dropping at all. The lake here is quite warm, so it's probably about the same temperature. And yeah, it's not really moving, so we've got about 26 degrees for water temperature as well. And that's how we do our temperature readings. Okay, so that sort of gave you a good sense of, of how those hanometers worked. Um, so the key as well is to make sure that you're keeping the, the meter, or if you're using a, a pool thermometer as well, uh, in the shade before you take your measurements and to do air temperature first. So as soon as you get the, the probe wet, um, it would skew your air temperature reading. So make sure you do air temperature first and then you can do your water. Uh, also double check that you're using the right units. So obviously degree Celsius temperature, that little um, mu, the, the micro Siemens uh, for conductivity and pH, which will have no units, but it will say pH up at the top. Uh, if you are using a container uh, to take your reading, just make sure you rinse it and the meter uh, really well with distilled water, both before and after uh, you take those measurements. Um, make sure you don't put the hand meter right into the water, right underwater. It does say in the instructions that it's waterproof and it says right on it, waterproof. Um, but from our experience, uh, once, because we've had to take the, the little battery cap off um, to activate them, and once that cap comes off, they really aren't waterproof. <laughs> So just make sure you're mindful of that. Um, if it gets splashed around a little bit, it's it should be fine, but yeah, full submersion is, is not it. So, uh, so just taking those, those measurements right at the surface there. Um, as far as the um, waiting for values to stabilize, uh, if it's really bouncing around a, a lot, the numbers, um, you'll have to leave it in a bit longer until, until the values seem to, to sort of settle down. And you will see that little clock um, kind of up on the, the side that will disappear when when the unit has, uh, is ready for a measurement. Uh, so when you're finished doing your measurements, uh, put the cap back on while it's wet to keep that, that pH bulb moist. That's really kind of the most sensitive part of the instrument. And so you wanna make sure you don't touch that little glass bulb on there. Uh, and this year we're gonna provide folks with some storage solution. Um, and so you'll actually put that into the pH side of the cap. So when you look in the cap, there'll be kind of a little circular well in there. And so you can just put a couple of drops in there, um, mostly if you're going to be letting it sit for probably more than a week in between your measurements. And then it should be good to go there. Okay, so we're going to move on to uh, installing a temperature logger for those of you who are going to get that piece of equipment. 
All right, so we're here down at the end of a dock uh, with a temperature logger and going to install it for the season. So when you get the little temperature loggers, uh, they're going to be launched already, so they'll be ready to go. And you can tell, because if you look where it says OK, you'll see a little red light flash every once in a while. So that means the battery is functioning and you're good to go. So you want to pick an area of your dock that's going to stay submerged for the whole season. Uh, so ideally you'd want it maybe a half a meter to a meter down, uh, but it really depends on your dock uh, setup. So for this instance, uh, this is perfect. We've got some chain going down here, so I can just zip tie it to that chain. And if necessary, if the water level uh, rises or falls, that can be adjusted uh, through the season. So if you do end up needing to change the depth of your temperature logger, uh, just make sure you write down um, the, the time and the date that you had to take it out to reposition it, uh, just so we have a record of when the logger was actually out of the water. And then likewise, when you're putting in for the first time, uh, make sure you write down uh, date and time. So again, uh, because this is actually taking measurements uh, as we speak, so we want to know when it actually uh, gets put into the water. So just going to pull up this chain here up to about a meter ish and so I have supplied everyone with uh, a couple of zip ties and they will go through the little uh, hole that's at the top of the logger so I'm not actually going to put this one on it's just a test here but we're just going to feed that through and zip tie it on nice and tight and there'll be nice long uh, flagging tape on here so if for some reason uh, the logger does let go uh, you can hopefully find it uh, on the bottom. Um, these units are rather expensive, so be very careful where you put this, uh, that it's not going to be interfered with a boat, uh, the prop, or anything like that. Um, and they can just stay in there for the entire season. Uh, take them out, um, you know, whenever you would maybe take out your dock uh, as late as October. They can actually handle uh, being under ice, but ideally we'd want it to, to come out um, you know, when your dock's going to come out and if you're no longer up at the cottage for the season. Um, and so, yeah, then we can uh, download those. We'll collect them at the end of the season, download the data onto our uh, computers at the office, and we'll be able to give you a nice graph of how the temperature fluctuated throughout the year. Isha here, just going to do a little demonstration for you on how to install a stream temperature logger for the Stream Watcher program. <clears throat> so you're going to get a little temperature logger that looks just like it. This has uh, some flagging tape on it for visibility sake and it will already be launched for you and ready to go. And you'll be able to check this. Uh, there's a little um, window here that says OK beside it and if you see a little red flashing light every few seconds or so that means it's uh, it's recording and ready to go. So you're going to take your uh, logging housing unit provided by SSEA, just unscrew the the end here and stick your logger along with all that flagging tape just tuck it all in there and then you're going to screw that back on You want to do it fairly tight, but keep in mind that you do have to get it off at the end of the season, so <laughs> don't go uh, too, too hard. And then you want to find a site where it's deep enough that you're going to um, have water coverage for the whole season. So you have to keep an eye on it, and if the river uh, drops, you may have to move it a little bit deeper. Um, but then also keep in mind, if you're going to retrieve it in the fall, that if the water comes up, you don't want it to be so deep that you can't access it. So for a demonstration purpose, we're just going to tuck it in right here. And so you're going to want to take a mallet or a hammer or something like that to actually bang it down into the stream sediment. And so this just helps really kind of keep it in place if stream flows come up. So we're going to just knock that in there. You're going to get wet doing this. There we go. Uh, hip waders are definitely an asset here. Um, so next thing you want to do is uh, sort of look at where the, the logger is and two things. So make sure it's well hidden, especially if it's a, a place where other people might wander by. So you can kind of tuck rocks around it and just sort of um, make it blend into the, the local environment. 
And the other thing is to remember exactly where you put it. It's amazing how much sediment these things can collect and really blend in and makes it really hard to find um, at the end of the season. So the best way to do that is to sort of look for any features close by. So uh, there's a bridge down here, for example. So I might measure the distance upstream from the bridge. Um, and if there's any kind of rocks or features close by, uh, just to mark those out as well. And what we generally do um, with our temperature loggers is just sort of hold the mallet over top and try to get a picture with that, that marker. So then at the end of the season, you can kind of look at your photo and say, oh, that's, you know, triangulate exactly where you are to, to find your logger again. So after you've placed your logger, you're also going to want to make sure you note the date and the exact time that you put the logger in the stream. So because the logger is already launched, it's recording temperature um, right from the time you get it. So we want to make sure we know when, when the logger is actually measuring stream temperature as opposed to ambient air temperature. And then the other thing to note, obviously, is uh, safety in, in terms of getting into the stream. So making sure that uh, it's not too deep, that, uh, that it's going to be dangerous for you, or that the flow velocity isn't, isn't so fast that it's going to sweep you off your feet. So just making sure to, to gauge conditions before you, you wade in, in, into the stream. So fairly straightforward, the instructions there. And one thing I will note with the temperature loggers is that we can only provide loggers to folks who are actually monitoring on their own private property. Um, it's a bit tricky if we, we put uh, loggers out where um, the site might be publicly accessible, they do tend to go missing. So, and again, just because these are quite expensive units, um, it will just be for, for folks that are doing it on their own property. Okay. So moving on to some of our weather observations that we're, we'll get you guys to do. Um, so just kind of simple observations like cloud cover and this sort of helps with uh, contextualizing some of the, the water clarity observations that we get from, uh, from participants. And precipitation. So if you don't have a rain gauge, uh, you can still note whether you've noticed any precipitation, uh, especially within the last 24 hours uh, are important for leading up to your sampling. And if you want to enter any kind of descriptive notes, you know, whether it's a heavy rain or just a light, light drizzle, uh, you can do that. Uh, and then any observations that, uh, that you observe while you're actually out there. So if it's a really hazy, foggy day, um, if it's been a drought, something like that, that you think might have uh, some relevance for your water quality um, measurements. So we're just going to quickly go over um, how to install your rain gauge on your property. Uh, so the gauge, uh, it's just a small little one. Uh, be careful the, the tube is glass, uh, so just be aware um, and careful of that in case it breaks. Uh, so it'll come with uh, two little holes on the base and on the side. So you can mount it either on your deck um, or on a stake sort of in the, in the middle of a lawn area. It's up to you uh, where the best place is on your property. Um, you do want to be aware of what is around the rain gauge. Uh, so the rule of thumb is uh, the height of the closest thing, so be it a building or a tree, you want to be twice that distance away with your rain gauge. For, so for example, uh, the SSA office here, uh, which is, uh, I'm going to ballpark maybe uh, 20 feet high, so we'd want to be uh, 40 feet away from that building. Uh, so trying to find that best place on your property where it's nice and open and there won't be interference um, with the rain gauge. And so you'll just uh, install that the best way that you can um, and then take your readings uh, after every rainfall. Uh, so the, the gauge uh, shows measurements in both centimeters and inches and so we want it recorded in centimeters. Uh, and then once it's done uh, or once you've recorded a, a rain event, you just twist the little a tube out and shake out the rain, put it back in and you're ready for the next rain event. Okay, so as I mentioned in the video there, the location of the gauge is very important. So just making sure that, uh, that there's no obstructions around. And we've actually provided folks with, or will be providing um, forms that you can sort of sketch out where your gauge is in relation to, to some of those other things around the property. Uh, so we only have so many gauges to, uh, to, to hand out to volunteers. Um, and so we do prefer that if you're going to install one that it's at your full-time residence, sort of gives us the, the most reliable data. Or if you're going to be at a seasonal residence kind of for the entire monitoring season, that's fine as well. But really needing to, to check that um, 
on a, a frequent enough basis, um, basically after every rain event. Um, you can check it uh, daily as well, just to make sure it's, it's not gonna be uh, clogging up with any kind of debris. Um, and so the video said record in centimeters and that should actually be millimeters. <laughs> So uh, that tends to be the, the standard for rainfall measurements, although we can obviously convert in between. Uh, and if there is a period where you weren't able to take a measurement, um, you know, you know you're away for a week or so and, and there was a big rainstorm, uh, just indicate that period that you weren't around just so that we know um, that it's not necessarily there was no rain, it's just you weren't able to, to check the case. Um, and if you are interested in measuring rainfall, but we weren't able to give you a gauge, uh, you can purchase one. They're pretty cheap. Um, $5 is, is um, the cost, the, the one that we got at Home Hardware. You're definitely welcome to do that. All right, so we're at the shoreline here and we're going to do a uh, wind measurement and also a wave direction. So in your kit, you will get a little uh, weather vane thing. So there's two parts to it. There's the arrow part and the very high-tech pencil. There we go. So you're going to take the little eraser tip which is protecting you from the pin. Just stick that on the end of your pencil and you're going to take that pin and put it straight into the eraser of the pencil. So try to put it in so it's uh, going parallel with the pencil and the arrow should be able to spin very freely okay so what you're going to do is line this up into the direction of the wind and then use your compass to determine what direction that's coming from so I'll just turn into the wind here so you can see it's coming from across the lake and the arrow is picking that up uh, if it's not quite as windy, sometimes uh, this is a little squirrely and, and it's harder to get a reading. So you can twist it in the direction that you know the wind is not facing and make sure it sort of spins around to where it's coming from, just as a check. Okay, so we have a pretty good direction here. You'll notice it'll waver a little bit. That's okay. You want to just sort of get the main uh, direction it's coming from. So you're going to line up your compass and then find your north arrow and line that up so that red lines up with red. Okay, so I've got the red from the dial lining up with the red needle. And it's in the direction of my wind vane. There we go. You want to make sure you hold the compass away from anything metal that might be on you, so belts, anything like that. And then you're gonna take the reading off that compass. So we've got uh, 310 degrees. So that's our wind direction. Now to do the wave direction, um, on smaller bodies of water, they're often the same, but sometimes, you know, if you're on the tiny township shoreline, the waves could actually be coming from a slight, slightly different direction than the wind itself, you know, depending on how things have shifted throughout the day. So same idea, uh, we don't need this anymore. So you're going to use your compass and just sort of take a look at the, the average direction that the waves are coming in at. Okay, so it looks about out that way. So again, I'm going to line up red arrow with red arrow and take that reading. So it's about the same, about 310 degrees. And you can mark that down on your data sheets. And then to store your little wind vane, whoops. Uh, you're going to take the eraser, uh, just pop that off and stick the pin uh, to cover it up, keep that safe, and then stick it back in your uh, case for the next time. Okay, so I think that was fairly straightforward and uh, so we've got some additional um, instructions here and if you need some more help on, uh, on using the compass, uh, you can check out the manual, there's, there's more detail in there as well. Uh, so I think we'll move along to the next the next thing, which is looking at water clarity and uh, using your Secchi disk. So we've got our Secchi disk here. We're going to use to measure how clear the water is and also to measure the depth right down to the bottom uh, at our spot. 
And so you'll notice the disc is marked out into black and white quadrants. And so this helps us see it when uh, it goes down to the water and you can tell when it disappears and reappears. So we're just going to lower this down. You'll notice your rope is marked uh, with black and red zip ties. So the black zip ties mark every meter and then the red zip tie indicates the five meter mark uh, just for ease of counting. So we'll lower this down until you can't see that black and white disc anymore. And when you get to the spot where you can't see it, you're going to take one of your clothespins and put it right where the water meets the rope. And then you're going to raise the rope up until you can just start to see the disc again. So you're marking those two depths. They should be pretty close together. So where it disappears and then reappears. Okay, so I've got my two de uh, depths here. Raise it all the way back up. So we've got count to our uh, first zip tie. So this is one meter. And then we're going to measure in between uh, the two clothes pins. So kind of right at that halfway point. So you can put your finger there and move one of your clothes pins. So it's easier to measure. Take your other one off so you don't get confused. And then we're going to use the ruler uh, in centimeters to measure the rest of that uh, distance more accurately. So we've got, uh, looks like 12 centimeters. So that's our one meter plus 12 centimeters. So 1.12 meters will go into your data sheet. So now we're gonna do this again, but this time let the disc go all the way down to the bottom so we can get the total depth. And same thing, you're gonna take your clothespin right at the water surface. It can be tricky if the boat is moving. Ideally, you would want to set an anchor, which we uh, were not able to. Bring your disc back up. So now you can use those zip ties to count. So again, we've got one meter, two meters, and now we'll use our ruler for the last bit. And this is 73 centimeters. So 2.73 meters is the total depth at this spot. Okay, so just a couple of points to reiterate here. Um, you're gonna to wanna to make sure, especially if you're doing uh, this reading from a boat, um, to, to make sure you do it on the shaded side of the boat. So, or your dock as well. Um, so the sun can really sort of interfere with, with how deep you're able to see the disc, uh, just sort of how the, the glare comes off the surface of the water. Um, but you actually don't wanna wear, it's tempting, but you don't wanna wear polarized sunglasses in particular while taking that clarity reading um, because it actually allows you to see a bit further down into the water and sort of biases that measurement. So no sunglasses and make sure you're on the shaded side if possible. I would say avoid taking measurements in really wavy conditions. It can just be really difficult to, to get those clothespins on um, uh, sort of in the, the most accurate location. Although having said that, we've, we've definitely had to, to do our sampling in very wavy conditions. So it's possible, but uh, not quite ideal. And it's also more difficult to anchor in that situation as well. Um, if you are measuring from a boat, uh, I would say it's ideal to, to set an anchor and just make sure uh, you're not drifting too much. So you'll be able to tell if the rope going down is sort of in a vertical line, that's what you wanna see. Um, and another thing to point out um, is to do the water clarity reading first before you do the total depth reading. So you'll probably notice when I pulled the disc up after doing the depth reading, I pulled up a bunch of sediment along with it. So that would actually um, kind of interfere with your water clarity reading. So definitely do that one first and then do your total depth. Um, and then just some additional uh, some tips here on uh, recording that measurement, um, which is also going to be in your training manual. So, jump into something new this year for those folks who are doing stream sites, uh, and that's doing a stream flow measurement.
Aisha Shadet here, water scientist with the SSEA, and I'm going to show you briefly just how to do a flow velocity measurement for the Citizen Science Streamwatch program. So first what you're going to want to do is find a section of stream that is as straight as you can get, um, roughly sort of a, a 25 foot or 8 meter section of, of stream or river that, that doesn't have too many curves and bends to it. Um, also want to look for a section that doesn't have a lot of log jams and rocks and things for your float to get hung up on. So the next thing you're going to want to do is take two stakes. So I've got just a big nail here tied off with some flagging tape and I'm going to use that as my first stake. And then take a measuring tape, um, ruler if you have it, whatever is kind of easiest for you, and measure out your distance. So try and get that as accurate as possible. So here we've got uh, eight meters down to my next stake uh, downstream. And so next you want to uh, collect a little bundle of uh, a few different sticks, uh, things that are heavy enough that you can toss it easily. Um, but obviously uh, that's also going to float. So pine cones can work really well as well. So I have my little pile of sticks here. And then what we're going to do basically is toss the sticks upstream of the first measuring point and then time it as it goes downstream to the next measuring point. And we're going to do that three times and take an average of those three. So I've got a stopwatch here. Uh, you can use a smartphone as well. Whatever timing device is easiest. And got some uh, paper and pencil to take my notes. So we'll get started. So I'm going to toss it up upstream enough that gives me time to get my, uh, my timing uh, stopwatch going. Try and get it around this tree here. Okay, so as this stick comes down to my measuring point, start my timer. And I'm just going to follow that down and stop it when it gets to the next stake. And ideally you would stand right in front of that marker so you know exactly when it gets there. But I will lose you in the camera, so I'll <laughs> just stand here. And there we go, it's about 20, 19 seconds. So I'm just going to do another toss here to show you. And when you, want, when you look at your stream site, um, you'll notice that water is moving at different velocities, sort of depending on where in the channel you are. So out in the middle of the channel is where it tends to move the fastest, if it's kind of a straight shot of, uh, of stream. And along the sides, it's moving a little more slowly. So that's why when we toss the, our sticks in, um, you want to get it as close to the middle of the channel as you can. So it might take a few tries, um, depending on how wide the, the stream is. And so that's why you want to have a, a good collection of sticks to, um, to keep going as you need to. So we'll just try to get into the middle again. There we go. And then I'm going to repeat that two more times and take an average of those values. And that will give us flow velocity. Um, so this is what we call the float method uh, to calculate inflow flow velocity and just gives you a sense of uh, how, how fast the stream is moving and then if you can also safely get into the middle of the stream and take a depth measurement as well then that will give you another indication of, uh, of how much water is going through. So just a couple of other things to point out in terms of safety. So when you're looking at your, uh, your stream site, if it looks like the water is going to be more than a meter depth, uh, then it's not safe to go in. And if it is a meter depth, but it feels like it's very slow moving, you don't feel any force against your body um, and you feel comfortable going that deep, uh, then that's okay. But if the water is moving very quickly, it might be less than a meter depth um, and you feel that pressure against your body and feel like it, it could um, push you over and make you lose your balance, uh, then it's not safe to go in at that point. And we would just do measurements, um, the velocity measurements from the side and don't worry about the, the channel depth. Okay, so just to kind of reiterate, uh, the safety thing is, is definitely a big one, uh, making sure you're not going into the stream if it's uh, too fast flowing or too deep. Um, and not everyone has to do this, uh, this velocity measurement. It's definitely optional. Uh, if you want to just sort of uh, make a descriptive, descriptive observation uh, about stream flows, such as low, medium, or high, that's, that's fine as well. But for those who, uh, who want to delve a little bit deeper, then, uh, then we've got this method for you. And as far as doing the stream depth, uh, so use your meter stick to, to measure that and make sure you're measuring from the same location at each sampling visit and out sort of in the deepest part of that channel. 
Okay, so moving on to just some general water observations that you might include uh, when you're out there. So things like uh, color that you notice in the water um, and sort of looking for, for something that's not necessarily related to the color of the sky. So if it's a really gray day, then the water might look a little more gray. But if you actually look down it, it might still be fairly clear. So more interested in, you know, if the, the water itself has a really brown or kind of yellow or green color to it, um, then definitely note anything like that. <coughs> And if you are using a Secchi disc, uh, you can sort of use the white part of the disc to look down and, and uh, note that color that you might observe. And then also just note any other things that, uh, that might be happening. So you might see uh, mayfly cases on the surface of the water. You can see the middle photo there. They, they almost look like um, little fish larvae. You might see foam on the water or pollen, anything like that. You can take note of those. And then the other aspect is, uh, is looking at algae. All right, so I'm just gonna demonstrate here how you would go about collecting an algae sample. Uh, if you do happen to come across what you suspect might be blue-green algae um, that you're concerned about. So first, uh, we ask that you take a picture and send it into the office, like with a bit of a description, and we'll kind of go from there if, if it warrants bringing in a sample. And if that is the case, um, we recommend that you wear gloves just in case there are uh, algae toxins present. Um, so we're just gonna pop these on. And if it looks like it's just really concentrated on the surface, uh, you can take your sample bottle and just dip it right in, uh, get a, just a small sample, and that's fine. If it's quite uh, distributed throughout the water and it's, it's hard to get a nice concentrated sample, um, you can use something like a yogurt tub. So just scoop up a, a bit of water here. And then I've provided folks with uh, coffee filters. So you can actually filter the water through here just to concentrate it down a bit. So we'll just pour that in. Oops. Just enough to sort of concentrate it. So when we pour it into the bottle, uh, it'll be easier for us to, to pick out some of those uh, algae cells and look at them under the microscope. So we'll just let that drain out a bit. And when it looks like you can see a lot of the, the floaty stuff in there, you can tape your bottle and just fill it up. It doesn't take too much for us to, to be able to look at it uh, under the microscope. So that's all you need. Cap that. Uh, make sure you write the uh, date and where you're located. Um, in you know permanent marker and then pop that in the fridge until we're either able to collect it from you or you're able to drop it off at our Port Magnical office and then we'll have a look. So that's it for the videos um, and just to sort of reiterate about uh, collecting algae so definitely get in touch with with us if you uh, think it might be a, a harmful algae situation and you can go to this YouTube video uh, on our, our YouTube channel and it sort of gives you a sense of uh, sort of how to distinguish some of the nuisance algae that you might see. So, uh, you know, green algae that might be out there versus some of the more potentially harmful blue green algae. So I definitely recommend checking that video out and it's got some, some good photos in there. So if you do suspect something, uh, get in touch with us and, and we can start that process. Um, depending if it's, uh, if it does look like a severe bloom, uh, we can in initiate that process of, uh, of going to the Ministry of Environment about that as well. So just a couple of last things uh, that you can observe. So things like water level and flood damage. Uh, water levels on Georgian Bay have come down this year, thankfully. And so hopefully that, um, that's not quite as extreme as far as impacts that, that you might be seeing out there. But any you know, kind of storm related damage that you might notice, uh, you can document. And again, with photos, you know, kind of looking at both a, a wide landscape type perspective and then maybe closer into to some of that specific damage. And if you do notice anything sort of outside your usual monitoring time period, you can include it in the notes sort of the next time you monitor, so you're, you're still kind of documenting that. Looking at things like wildlife and invasive species and species at risk, um, Tamara is going to talk a little bit about some specific invasive species that we're interested in, but we still encourage you to document um, anything kind of more general that you might see. 
Um, and so again, making sure that if you're uh, if you're observing something outside your usual time monitoring time period, you can still include that in your notes for the next time. Um, monoculars or binoculars will definitely help you um, if you're looking at birds or anything like that, sort of get a closer view. There's a lot of really good naturalist guides out there if you're not sure on uh, on what exactly you're looking at and maybe you want to learn a bit more about uh, identification. So iNaturalist, uh, the app called Seek is really good for that. Uh, you can import report invasive species settings to, uh, it's called EdMaps. So it's sort of a, an online mapping database. Uh, and we can also help you do, through that process. Uh, in terms of species at risk, uh, make sure you don't share any of those locations kind of outside your, uh, your data sheet that comes to us which is kept confidential. And this really helps uh, just protect species at risk, um, which might be sort of at, at risk of either persecution or um, you know, people wanting to, to seek them out. Like maybe it's a rare plant and people get really excited about taking photos of orchids, for example. So you don't want uh, hordes of folks looking at those, uh, those kinds of things. And again, that's something that you can report online if you're interested. <clears throat> the, uh, the Natural Heritage Information Center and also just an interesting um, resource for you to look at and see what uh, species at risk might actually occur in your area. Human impact is another thing that, that we're interested in seeing. So things like litter or maybe shoreline alterations that, uh, that people around your area have done that you might be concerned about. And so you can note these. Um, so really interested as well in, in impacts that we might be able to assist with some restoration. So when we go and seek funding, you know, sometimes we can we can look at some of these sort of observations and prioritize what areas might need some, some attention. I uh, just want to make note that we we would never uh, report to the authorities, um, you know, anything that that you observe. But if you think you're seeing something that might be in violation of environmental regulations, we do encourage you to contact uh, the authorities. So whether that be your your municipal bylaw. Uh, if it's related to fisheries and fish habitat, uh, reaching out to the Ministry of Natural Resources or Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And if it's something more relevant, uh, like pollution, a spill or something like that, uh, algae bloom that you might want to get in touch directly with the Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks. So once you've collected all that amazing, great data, um, you want to get it all into your spreadsheets. And we will periodically check in kind of throughout the season and make sure that data entry process is going smoothly. Uh, we did have some, some hiccups last year, some folks that had trouble with, uh, with those spreadsheets. And if you are sending paper sheets, uh, that's fine as well. So you can send them directly to our office or uh, just take pictures of them and, and submit them that way. Uh, in terms of photos, we do get a large number of photos from volunteers. So if you can sort of adopt a bit of a, a file naming system, we would really appreciate it. <laughs> uh, you can rename your pictures right on your phone or on your uh, computer desktop, right within Google Drive. Uh, you know, it's, it's not too hard to, to uh, rename those files. And that just really helps us uh, so that we make sure we know what the picture is, what the subject matter is. Uh, in terms of getting photos to us, again, we're sort of working on uh, an app. Um, and until, until that time, uh, it's best to share through Google Drive if you're able to, or Dropbox, or uh, you can put all your pictures into a zip file and put those up on a file share service. So we've had really good success with uh, WeTransfer and you don't have an account, have to have an account to, to set that up. So our email server won't actually take zip files or emails that have attachments more than 10 megabytes, which is and you won't get any notice that it didn't come through. <laughs> so it's kind of unfortunate on our end, but uh, if, if we haven't acknowledged that we've received pictures from you, then probably assume that it didn't come to us. So try as much as you can uh, send through, uh, through one of these file share services. In terms of taking care of your kit, uh, just to kind of note that the items are not toys. So there are some components that, that might be either sharp or really delicate. Uh, so it definitely requires some supervision if you're going to take your kids out to join you in, in doing some monitoring, which we definitely encourage. It's a great learning opportunity, uh, but just to be mindful of, of some of those items. Make sure you let things dry out, uh, particularly the second discs and the rope. They can get kind of mildewy if, if they're put away wet. Uh, making sure you're keeping stuff out of sunlight and away from, from any harsh chemicals. 
The hand meter in particular, as I mentioned, so it's important to keep that pH bulb from drying out. We will be giving you some of that storage solution. And then uh, really important that we get the hand meters and the temperature loggers back at the end of the season. So they both need calibrating before they go out uh, for next year. And then also we have to download the temperature loggers. Um, so everything else, uh, we're moving forward, we're gonna let you guys keep the kit items uh, you know, into next year if you plan to continue monitoring. But just those two items do need to come back to our office. They're also quite expensive. So <laughs> we really wanna make sure that they stay in good condition and, uh, and that we get those back. Okay, and we're getting near the end here. Thank you for your patience. Uh, so last couple of things is we love seeing pictures of people doing the monitoring. So it's great for us to, to be able to share with uh, municipal councils and our funders. They really like to see all this kind of stuff in action. So even if it's just a couple of times, if you can get someone out uh, that can help and take pictures of you doing your monitoring, then that's great. We are gonna send a, a survey again at the end of the season just to get your feedback. We got some really great comments uh, from last year and tried to incorporate those where we could. Uh, as I mentioned, so the, the meters and the loggers uh, need to come back and so we can arrange that uh, either drop off to our office in the fall or uh, we can arrange to pick that up from you. Um, also 2020 results uh, are available. So you can go onto our website, the citizen science page on our website and take a look at that report. Uh, so uh, some folks might be interested. And we also created a presentation from that and we'll be posting that on YouTube. So I'll send everybody a link uh, when that's ready. And just wanted to really thank some of the funders that we've actually had for this program across the years. Uh, so the TD grant uh, has been really supportive, uh, World Wildlife Federation in the past, and then the Lake Huron Georgian Bay uh, Watershed Network as well. So I appreciate uh, everyone's attention and we can do some questions now and then Tamara is going to talk a little bit about uh, her invasive species spotters program. Bob, I see your hand up. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You mentioned in the rain meter, keep it twice the distance of the nearest height. I, yeah. got, some, I got some 75 foot trees. Right. <laughs> it can definitely be challenging finding a, a really good spot. I would have to drive five miles to get it in there with your requirements. Yeah, for sure. I just the, the best spot. Yeah, and I think that's that's sort of why we have a, a site diagram too, so that if people know what, what obstacles might be around, then we can just take that into consideration when we see your data. So it, it might be fine. Um, but if we do notice some discrepancies, say, between, between your data and, and the nearest volunteer, then we'll know why, why that might be happening. But it'd be, it'd be good to see um, if, if that makes too much of a difference. It, it might not, uh, depending on the shape of the tree, you know, might not be too bad. Well, it's not the shape of the trees, it's the uh, density of all of them. Right, yeah, so if it's sort of a wall of trees. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I think just marking that, that on your uh, your site sheet. Okay, you're going to give me a, a, sir, a question too. You're going to give me some equipment. How are we going to get that to me? Right, so we are going to do a drop off to folks. So for those participants who might be uh, new this year to the program, what we did last year was uh, picked a day where uh, it kind of worked for the majority of people and we just dropped it off to your front door, your mailbox, kind of wherever you uh, yeah. tell us to put it. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Um, hi. hi. <laughs> Very nice to see everybody. Yeah. Um, I, I, my, my question is, can, can we have a copy of that PowerPoint presentation, Asia? Absolutely. So we uh, we are recording the session, so we're going to put that up on YouTube oh, uh, so people can take a look later. And then we also have a, a pretty detailed field manual that goes into a little bit more um, on each of these methods. So everyone will, will get a copy of that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Judy, did you have a question or just made a noise? <laughs> no, no, I, I was just trying. I didn't get to catch it fast enough. The, the YouTube about the algae was, um, but if, if this is going to be put up somewhere, I can watch it again. 
Yes, and that link, um, it, it's, if you go to our, our YouTube channel, you can find it in our videos there. And that link will also be in the training manual. So you can get okay. it. Okay, oh, good. All right, that's great. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Can, 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 we, can I borrow Lux for a day? <laughs> I'll have to check with them. <laughs> I, 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 I don't, I've not ever used the Google, so that, that, that'll, I'll figure okay. it out, yeah. Well, and uh, yeah, if, if folks do have some specific questions about some of the technology, then we can definitely do some one-on-one -on -one sessions okay. for sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll connect with you, yeah. All right. Awesome. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead, Tom. Can you please, uh, well, I got to get a pen, but I want to know the name of the Google app thing that, um, to track all the stuff. Okay, so it's called Google Sheets. Hang on one sec. <laughs> so Tom is an invasive species spotter. So maybe, um, Tom, maybe I, I'm kind of interpreting for you, but it sounds like you might be interested in doing a shore watch program. Yes. Okay, so maybe uh, Aisha can follow up with you after. Okay. Just yeah, with more sure. information. Sure. Yeah, so that, uh, that app is called Google Sheets, and it's basically like a, a Google uh, online version of Excel. So if you've ever used uh, Excel spreadsheets, then, then you'll be off to the races. Is this the same one we're supposed to use for um, uh, the Gypsy Moth monitoring? Um, it's a little bit different, Tom. It's the same platform, but it's a different application. So the one that you're using for the Gypsy Moth would be um, Google Forms. So that one is where you just fill in the blanks on a form and right. um, it automatically generates a Google Sheet for you. So you don't have to do that. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good. Makes sense. Thank you. Awesome. Okay. If we have no other questions, uh, I'll pass it over to Tamara. So she's going to talk a bit about, uh, so this is a sort of an additional program that for folks who are do the, doing the shore watch monitoring, so the lake specific monitoring, if you're interested in also looking for this particular invasive species, then you're welcome to join in, uh, in the invasive species spotters uh, program with Tamara. Uh, and if you're doing stream sites, then it's not quite as applicable, but you're welcome to, to stay on and, uh, and sort of learn a bit more about uh, this particular invasive species. 